All right, I'm here with actor and uh, as of tonight, playwright David yeah. Gregory. How are you? Say, I'm good. Right. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well, thanks. So let's talk a little bit about your background as an actor. I know a lot of daytime audiences will know you uh, as Robert Ford on mm -hmm. One Life to Live. Mm -hmm. um, but you've done so much since then. Let's talk about that. You sure. You were uh, on The Good Fight. On The Good Fight, somebody said, <laughs> they said, oh, I'm so proud of you. Let me shut the door just in case you can't hear. Okay. Um, they said, I'm so proud of you for, you know, it's a great show and it's, it's, it's great writing, which it is. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to play a lawyer on The Good Fight, you have to be a pretty good actor. And I was like, ah, it's funny because I'm not playing a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it, but I'm playing a boy toy of the lawyer. I got a couple episodes out of it. I had a good time. But cool. it's, um, I told my agent, if I feel like I'm the weakest link in the chain, then I might be in the right place. And I don't mean to belittle myself, just the idea that there's some heavy hitters on the show. Mm -hmm both behind the scenes and from the camera and so I think if you find yourself in the company of people that are um, let's say more seasoned than you mm -hmm. then you can only go up and though I was playing a boy toy though I was showing parts of my anatomy that most people <laughs> don't see uh, I think that the, I learned a lot because of that so yeah well the daytime audiences remember that that's probably what got me the job, actually. <laughs> now, you're also involved with another project uh, that featured a whole slew of daytime actors called Melange, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. I am so proud of the show. So, Tom Dangora is the mastermind behind it. He's the um, writer, producer. It's, it's his baby. Mm -hmm. And what he's done is he's assembled what is essentially a modern-day soap, uh, like a digital series like The Bay. Um, and the idea is that... It'll be a playground for a lot of daytime actors, but at the same time, we'll bring in um, people of different, what do I want to say, different um, different genre backgrounds, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So the idea is that the fan base can sort of widen. We shot the pilot early August, huge all-star cast, and um, I think they're, they finished editing it, they're shopping it around, trying to get it on either... I don't know if I can say the platforms, but the platforms that you all know and love that uh -huh. you want to watch uh, your shows on. <laughs> and the idea is uh, maybe by this time, hopefully by next year, maybe we could have the whole thing in the can. I think the first season would be eight episodes. He's already got them written out and he has a, a great plan. And that's another situation where I feel like maybe I'm, I don't want to say the weak link just because saying that too often is, is bad for your psyche. Mm -hmm. But for me, um, you know, my love interest is Diana DeGarmo, and you have Morgan Fairchild, and you have Omar Sharif Jr., and you have Scott Evans. I mean, it only goes up. So if I feel like I'm, like, in the kiddie pool, then, and they're no. the Olympians in the deep end, then we're doing okay. Yeah, that's It'll be a good product. What, uh, can you tell me a little bit about your character? Yeah, his name is Hunter Black. Ironically, he is a um, document documentary filmmaker, much like my character started out on One Life to Live. So he is putting together this documentary about this gay bar in Manhattan and the first 10 minutes of the pilot is actually showing the audience through his eyes, through his lens, um, these are the characters, this is what you need to know, and now here's our story. Mm -hmm. So it's, I was talking to Tom about, it's almost a Billy Wilder kind of storytelling where we're cutting through all the exposition by just giving you the narration and showing you up front, this is what's going on so that we can cut straight to the story. Uh, Billy Wilder is known for doing that in uh, something like Sunset Boulevard. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, here I am. I'm William Holden. I'm upside down in this swimming pool. Let me tell you how I got here. And all of a sudden, the audience is right there in the story. So, it, I, yeah, without giving too much away, um, that's me. Apparently, I, oh, and I got to shoot uh, with my own camera. They gave me a camera, and nice. they said, you're going to be this, document, this documentarian, but you're also going to be someone who's shooting real footage that we're going to use. And... I was told recently that they got to use some of mine, so I didn't mess up too bad. Maybe I have a career as a There you go. So if the acting doesn't work out. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> now, why don't we talk about why we're here. Uh, primarily, you have a new show. I do. That you wrote. Let's talk about that. This is my baby. This is seven years of research and development. Um, when I first moved to New York City, I was given Mark Elliott's biography on Jimmy Stewart. Mm -hmm. And it, it, while I was reading it, I noticed... A lot of parallels between him and Henry Fonda. Not only were they best friends, but they hung out a lot together. They built model airplanes together. Then the twist is that they're um, political enemies. And I thought, well, there's a play there. Of course, I didn't feel like I was capable of writing this at 22 years old. Um, when One Life to Live got canceled, I immediately enrolled in a playwriting class to try to see if I could sharpen my pencil on something like this. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I started writing the play, I guess I was probably 26 at the time. Got about 80% of it done, then my hard drive crashed and I lost most of it. Oh, that's and I thought, maybe it's not meant to be, maybe I'm just supposed to put it away. Mm -hmm. And I tried again, a couple years later, and I kept coming back to it. I thought, there's, there's, it's too good of an idea to shelve it. Picked it up again last year, um, just in time for Scott Iman's book about the two of them and their friendship coming out in, I guess it was October of last year. Um, we had a reading of my play last year, sort of got to fix certain things and change things around, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then it got accepted into a festival this last summer. After that, I was able to sort of say, okay, these are the things we need to change to make sure it works on stage. Mm -hmm. And then tonight, we've invited some producers, some potential investors, representatives of different theaters, um, regional theaters around the country and in New York to come take a look, offer their feedback. But I think we're operating with a script that's about 90% there. Um, it's definitely ready. Mm -hmm. I just, I have a really high standard for myself, so yeah. I feel like it's not good enough just to be good enough. Now, and your previous readings, did you have the same cast? Or? Uh, first reading, I had an actor named John Procaccino, great uh, New York stage actor. He's been so busy, he can't do this one, this mm -hmm. round. Um, but we had William Humans play Jimmy Stewart then, and he's back with us tonight as well. Tonight you'll also see John Wesley Shipp, mm -hmm. uh, the great flash soap opera um, legend that he is. Um, and I don't think a lot of people know what a great stage actor he is. He's playing Henry Fonda, and he's just... He, he surprised me, and I'm used to seeing him in various capacities and, as an actor, and I'm seeing things that I've not seen before, so that's really exciting. And that's saying something, because you guys work together on the soap. Sure is. You did Powder Burns. Powder Burns together. So yeah, yeah, yeah. this is like your third project. Yeah, I suppose um, he's turned into a bit of a muse for me. Yeah. He, every time I say, hey, I got this idea, I also tend to write for men in their 60s, I guess, maybe. I don't think that's... For some reason, mm -hmm. there's an old soul in me somewhere, so maybe there's something to that, and maybe that'll come back to assist me when I turn that age myself, and and nobody wants to see me. No one's tired. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and parade around on the good fight <laughs> without my clothes on. Now, uh, what were uh, some of the most challenging things that you found writing writing the show? It's a great question. So you're immediately working in the parameters of you can't change history. There are, uh, there are certain things that you just have to make sure that you show in order to tell this story. What I found most interesting is their biggest conflict was over the communist witch hunts in mm -hmm. the House on american Activities Committee, and there's nothing really written about this. It's We know what went on historically, but we don't exactly know what these two men thought. I, kn I can conjecture what Henry Fonda thought. He was a staunch Democrat. Let me close up this. He was a, uh, Fonda was a staunch Democrat. Stewart was a staunch Republican. So based on where they were politically, I can kind of conjecture this is probably what they would have said. Mm -hmm. um, even Jane Fonda is quoted as saying, you know, we know they had a big fight, but we don't know exactly what it was, what it was about, except that it had to do with the House on American Activities Committee. That ended up being one of the easier parts of the play. What I struggled with the most, ironically, was showing the audience how they became friends and, and showing how people kind of enjoy each other in that. You know, they started out as struggling actors in New York City. So there's a lot of misadventures and things that, mm -hmm. you know, getting too drunk and trying to find a subway, getting, things that are inherently theatrical, but maybe not dramatic, you know, because they are happy times. Right. So you have to be able to show these men having fun together. And one of the ways I, I kind of approached that was going back to what Neil Simon did with The Odd Couple and just showing kind of Felix and Oscar. You know, it's too broad of a stroke to say one's messy and one's clean. But Jimmy Stewart is definitely the more, well, no, we have to do things a certain way. And Fonda's like, no, who cares? We got to try it this way. And so you all of a sudden get a dynamic that's familiar to everybody in a friendship. You also, this is just from some situations I've been in in L.A. with friends of mine. The closer you are with someone, almost the harder time you, that you, you give them. Mm -hmm. So if you really want what's best for them, if you're really pushing at them, you're going to kind of butt heads a little bit more than you think. And once I figured that out, that was sort of the key to spinning this into. They really want what's best for each other, and mm -hmm. oftentimes their conflict is born out of genuine love. But I think what I want the audience to walk away with this play, um, what I want them to walk away with is we're in a time of political upheaval, and um, there's not a lot of crossing the aisle and listening and understanding, and there was a way of arguing that included some amount of dignity. Mm -hmm. and 
these men had that, but we don't have that anymore. And so maybe this play can help assist in holding the mirror up to our country today. I don't want to beat people over the head with it and say, you know, this is how we're supposed to act. But, you know, nobody wants to go to a theater and, and hear the things that, that they're trying to escape from. Right. And that's why it's important to have the fun part of this play kind of come back into play. And, and so hopefully I balanced it well enough. Um, like I was telling you before we started rolling camera, I don't think I believed in something as much as this play. And uh, for whatever reason, maybe it's my love letter to the baby boomer generation. Maybe I'm that screenwriter in Sunset Boulevard who's mm -hmm. face down in the swimming pool, come back to life. Maybe I'm reincarnated and that's why I feel so strongly about that generation. But golden age of Hollywood is, is something that I think is lost too. And so maybe, maybe this can help bring it back a little. What, what age ranges are the guys in the play? So the play takes place in 1969 when they're shooting the, Sci the Cheyenne Social Club, which is, I think, the last Western they shot together. Mm -hmm. So currently in the Vietnam War, they're in their early 60s. Okay. Um, but they will flash back and play early 20s. So it's a stretch for the actors as well to kind of... Um, it's a very, they're both very physical roles. They have to be able to be very agile and very... Um, you know, I've got them crawling around on the ground, I've got them jumping up and you know, a whole bunch of things. Because these men were also very agile. And mm -hmm. what is f fun to think about is that both of the, these men in real life love to be on stage. So then we have two men who love to be on stage being betrayed by two men who are on stage. And maybe there's a little bit of inception that happens where this play is supposed to be inherently theatrical. And I get very excited about that. Someday I'll turn 65 and I was I'll just get gonna, to play. Oh. Did you think, well, did you think that you could play the younger version and then age yourself up? I, 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 I thought it? about it for a second. Mm -hmm. I think um, any producer looks at this script and goes, oh, two actors in one set. That's pretty uh, inexpensive to produce. That's what I want. Um, I certainly have, in, in certain smaller readings of this play, have played fond of myself because mm -hmm. that's the part I wrote for myself to do in another 30 years. Um, I would love to do it. I just, for whatever reason, this particular idea speaks to me a lot. And call me crazy, but <laughs> I think it's better to put it in the hands of men that have, have the ages in their body. Do you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? That Absolutely. they've been through these experiences and they got, these guys just knock it out of the park. Uh, I happen to think even though this is just a staged reading today, that, mm -hmm. that people would pay good money to see both of these actors play these parts in the first place. So, not gone. Not gone <laughs> now, uh, what were some of your processes with writing? You know, primarily an acting background. Did you tap into any of that when you were writing up? This is how I would do this. Yeah, there's a, there's a little bit of that. I think um, they they mentioned to a lot of writers uh, advice that you should read your play aloud. And I always found that fascinating, like, well, why wouldn't you read it aloud? If it doesn't sound right coming out of your mouth, then you've got to change it. Right. But I think, I like to think of writing similar to acting in the sense that, you know, you see um, Daniel Day-Lewis play Lincoln, but you also see him in Last of the Mohicans, and he's mm -hmm. vastly different in both of those roles. So he puts on kind of a different hat and goes, all right, I'm going to switch gears now. So a good writer, I think, should be able to do the same thing and sit down and go, how do these men talk? And I'm lucky and and um, trapped by the idea that the, both of these men are so well known to the public that you kind of do have to write like what it's perceived that they talk like already. Mm -hmm. And we address that in the play is that, yes, they have an image that's on screen, but that image may not also be the person that they are. Most people that um, ran into Stuart off screen said, no, what you saw up on screen is the, the man that you got. But Fonda liked to say his was a little different. He's like, I don't think I'm nearly as nice a guy as the man up on the screen. So I would just watch a lot of their movies, try to ingest that and go, I'm just, a, I'm just as an actor, I'm just gonna put on that, that helmet, that mask, whatever that is, and say, all right, well, this is how they would talk. And that's very improvisational. And also as a consumer of art, I would go, well, what's the next scene that I wanna see? A lot of times we forget to write the things that would be funny to watch or there's this whole segment I read this whole story about them tunneling under their neighbor's house when they first moved to New York or first moved to LA because she was a big movie star and they wanted to see her and they, they got really drunk one night and it's alleged but it's also like they all have different versions of the story right. they love talking about it. I thought 
that would be fun to see on stage, having them get pickaxes. and So there's a segment of that in the play, and it's not necessarily because it's important to the plot. It's important because we need to see them bonding as friends, and it's a scene that is inherently theatrical. It's, it, it begs to be acted out. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe not being an actor, that's maybe not being a writer, that's just me being a consumer going, oh, this would be a great scene. And it also happens to fit into the canon of, of this arc of this story. So there's a few little things here and there, but at the end of the day, I just I studied great writers. I remember watching um, uh, Steven Spielberg's film Lincoln, mm -hmm. and uh, Tony Kushner, great playwright, wrote the script. And I'm watching it thinking, you know, here's scenes in the Senate of these men arguing with dignity and, and, and using, it's just class. And I thought, if they're gonna, if these two men are gonna argue, that's how I wanna see them do it. I wanna see them do it. Um, I, I, dignity's really the only word I can think of, but they do go at, get at each other's throats, but there's mm -hmm. always that sense of respect, which again, I think is lost in, and, uh, without getting too political, I just think it's important to remind people that maybe speaking that way is maybe the way to go. I don't know. Well, you can see how excited you are. So yeah. I'm very excited to see you. <laughs> I'm very excited to see the show. And I think you're uh, going to have a good time. Yeah, I think perfect. you're going to have a great time. Thank you so much for taking Thanks, the time Brian. to interview with Thanks, me. Thanks, everybody.